Hello, CBCS. Welcome to the Chapel Podcast. My name is Anastasia Davi, and I am the Community Life Prefect on campus. Today, we are joined with Pastor Brandon Reed. He's a pastor at Mountain View Church, and today he will bring us the Word of God from James chapter 1. So let's get into it. Good to be with you guys this morning. Want to uh, want to unpack a little bit from the New Testament book of James. James was the half brother of Jesus, and uh, we're not going to get into all of the the logistics of all of that. But it's important to know that we're reading a book. We're reading this letter from a sibling, from family of Jesus himself. Now we know that. Jesus was the firstborn in his family because he was born of the Virgin Mary. Then after Mary and Joseph got married, they had two other boys named James and Jude. Uh, So this is a letter from someone who's not just a disciple of Jesus, not just a follower of Jesus, but someone who is actually family uh, with Jesus, the Messiah. And so we're listening to, we're hearing from this letter Uh, of someone who is a sibling of Jesus, somebody that from his very earliest memories, even going back to childhood, was with Jesus. But if you've got siblings, anybody have any siblings? Yeah, you've got brothers, you've got sisters, you've got stepbrothers, sisters, some of which maybe are in the room. If you have siblings, you know that you don't always believe what they have to say. That you don't always trust them, that you don't always believe them when they're speaking to you and what they're talking about. And James was no exception to this. James, from very early on, even into his adulthood, didn't believe what Jesus was saying. But he took it to a whole different level because James, being family with Jesus, grew up with Jesus, had some interactions with Jesus and some of his very early followers. James, there's a story in Mark chapter 3, which Mark is... One of my favorite gospels, Mark kind of captures the story of Jesus in a really quick way, doesn't use a whole lot of words. And so in Mark chapter 3, Jesus goes home after he's performed miracles, after he's built out his team of 12, after he's started teaching some new things. Jesus goes home to be with his family. And the awkward part was all of these new followers, all of these people, all of this crowd started going home and following Jesus all the way back to his house. Not in like a stalker sense, but in a true like, we want to hear from Jesus, we want to learn from Jesus. And so the crowds follow Jesus home in Mark chapter 3, and his family is there, and they're all just trying to eat, they're all just trying to, to enjoy a nice family meal together, when all of these crowds are pressing in around Jesus. And so Jesus' family, including James, who we're going to read from, goes out to the crowd and says, okay, hey, nothing to see here, guys. This guy's kind of, he's a little bit off. There's, there's something going on here. And they, they in fact say he's out. Of, they in fact say that Jesus is out of his mind in Mark chapter 3. Now, before you're like, hey, how could you say that about Jesus? How could you say that Jesus is out of his mind? You've got to remember that, that part of this is coming from Jesus' siblings. Now, if you've got siblings, uh, you know that Typically, the oldest sibling, the oldest, usually is the one who makes all the mistakes. Now, I'm the youngest in my family. Any, any youngest siblings? Okay, where are all the oldest siblings? All right, so look around. These are the ones who make all of the mistakes that cause our parents to blame all of the youngest siblings, right? Anybody with me this, this morning? Yeah? Uh, the youngest siblings get blamed for all of the things that the oldest siblings do wrong, not to mention that for James and Jude, the brothers of Jesus, they had to deal with their brother walking around all the time telling them that he's the Messiah. Can you imagine your brother, your sibling saying, yep, I'm the Messiah, I'm the promised one. Yeah, sure, Jesus. Okay, you're just my brother. So he's walking around, Jesus is walking around in word and deed, being the son of God, and apparently James isn't buying it. He's not believing it. He's not believing what his brother is saying and teaching and doing. But when we continue to read through the scripture, we see that eventually 
uh, James in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as Paul is unpacking the truth of the resurrection, the proof of the resurrection. Uh, there's a little snippet in 1 Corinthians 15 about the brother of Jesus. As James is saying, hey, here are all of the people that Jesus appeared to right after he raised from the dead to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul says this, then Jesus appeared to James, his brother, then to all of the apostles. It's like Jesus forgot the childhood where James wasn't believing in Jesus. Could have been that Jesus may be remembered in this moment. James didn't want anything to do with me early on. And now that I've come back from the dead, now, now James wants to follow me and believe in me. There wasn't this moment for Jesus where Jesus went back to his brother and said, you didn't want anything to do with me before. Why do, you wanna, why do you wanna follow me now? Where were you when things were hard and you were saying, hey, don't, don't listen to this guy. Where were you growing up where, where I could have used another follower, another advocate, and you didn't even believe in me? No, there was none of that. Which tells me and it tells you that, that Jesus does not give up on us. Listen, his brother wrote him off. James wrote off Jesus. He wanted nothing to do with Jesus, and he was family and yet didn't give Jesus a chance until the moment that Jesus showed up to James. Can I just tell you this morning that, that maybe you feel like Jesus would give up on you if he knew what was going on in your life? Uh, if, if Jesus somehow figured out what you were thinking about? Uh, if Jesus really knew the problems that you've caused or the hurt that you've walked through. There's no way Jesus would want anything to do with you. But right here in the story of James, before we even get to the book of James, we see that Jesus never gives up on us, which is good news because when Jesus never gives up on us, that means he'll always show up for us. And he shows up to his brother and proves to his brother that I'm not done with you. I still love you. And I'm going to prove it to you with this. James, the brother of Jesus, finally met Jesus in this moment. And for James, it wasn't a proximity issue. It was a heart issue. For James, he grew up as close as you can get to Jesus. Literally in the same family, under the same roof as Jesus. And so following Christ isn't about a, a proximity issue. It's not about just getting closer to Jesus or closer to people who are around Jesus. It's not about being closer to knowing more and capturing more knowledge about Jesus. No, despite being the brother of Jesus, James's closest proximity to Jesus didn't change him. Let's drill down into this a little deeper. That, uh, that what that means is that you can grow up in church. You can grow up going to CVCS for your entire life, but James is proof that nobody is born into being a Christian. Uh, this isn't something that just happens by osmosis. No, this happens uh, by uh, Jesus showing up and, and us experiencing his grace. It's not about measuring up. It's not about cleaning up, picking up, or putting away the mess so that Jesus doesn't see what's going on in your life. No, it's about Jesus showing up with this reminder that he hasn't given up on us. He's not about to give up on us because of circumstances in our life. And his invitation is the same to you as it was with James. Will you follow me? And that's exactly what James did. He followed his brother as a disciple of Jesus. But it didn't just stop there because James knew the reality that Jesus doesn't just change our eternity. A lot of times we can get sideways into thinking that that this whole following Jesus thing is just an eternal life thing. It's just a heaven thing. I don't want to have to suffer the consequences of hell. And so I'm going to follow Jesus and trust in Jesus so that it'll change my eternity. No, James knew that Jesus changes more than just our eternity. He changes the here and now. And James embraced that when he stepped into this life of following his brother Jesus. And that led to him then being a, a leader in the early church in Jerusalem where this whole thing known as the local church started. This city where, uh, this ancient city where God's name dwelled, the hub of traditional Jewish religion, the central spot of all of the religious leaders from the area. And James became the leader of the Jewish, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Jerusalem 
council. He was the pastor of this very first church. And yet, this is how he opens the letter. In James chapter 1, verse 1, it's going to be on the screen for you, says this, James, now before we get too far, I want us to just stop there as he's introducing and telling us his name. When he introduces himself as James, you need to know that James is not actually his name because James is not a Hebrew name. Just stick with me in the classroom for a minute. I promise you we'll get back to chapel. But if you met James 2,000 years ago, you wouldn't have called him James. You would have called him Yaakov, which is Hebrew for Jacob. Uh, He's actually named after the living God, the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet, after centuries of transmission through so many languages, we get the name James. And we can't just breeze on by this. I know we're stopped in the very first word, in the very first chapter of this book, but I don't want you to miss that, uh, that there's a big story in just this name. And the story is this, that James putting his name on this letter shows us the change that Jesus brings in our life. You get a completely new name. You you get a new start. You get a brand new you because Jesus makes all things new. And so in the very first word, in the very first chapter of this letter, we see that Jesus makes all things new. James goes on to introduce himself. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we move any further, we got to wait and pause even here in this moment because we see that James has missed an opportunity here. James could have easily said, hey, I'm James, I'm the brother of Jesus, we grew up together, yeah, it's kind of a big deal, like, I'm the brother of the Messiah, hey, I'm here to tell you a little something about following Jesus. No, he doesn't do that at all. The people reading this letter, hearing this letter, would have made the connection early on, wait, this is Jesus' half-brother. We know it now today, and yet that's not how he leads. He didn't name drop in this moment, and What's amazing is that that many scholars argue that the book of James is the very first written down, recorded document in all of the New Testament, around uh, mid-40 A.D. And yet, from the very outset, from this very first document of the New Testament, James leads with the, the understanding of what Jesus actually came for. This new kingdom ethic that has nothing to do with us and everything to do with Jesus. I think James has a message for us today. If you want to go far, you've got to go low. What does he mean by this? What's the idea here? We got to, we got to humble ourselves that the, the life of following Jesus isn't a life of making much of ourselves. It's a life of making much of Jesus. But yet we live in a world in a culture where Every environment we're in, every event that we attend, all throughout history, even in our current history today, everything has always been anchored in acquisition. What can I get for myself? What's in it for me? What can I acquire? What can I achieve? What can I accomplish that's, that's going to be about me? And yet James flips the script here and says, no, it's not about me. It doesn't matter that I'm the brother of Jesus. It doesn't matter that I'm part of the family. I'm a sibling of the Messiah. No, what matters is that Jesus is made famous. In our culture, strength is what's wanted. You're strong enough to take it. It's about climbing the ladder. It's about being on top. It's about being the best, the fastest, gaining more and more and more, but yet it's never enough. The kingdom of God, following Christ, is about something so much different. It's actually not anchored at all in what we can accomplish or achieve or acquire, it's rather anchored in what we can relinquish, what we can let go of, what we can lay down, what we can set aside so that Jesus can be primary, which is good news for us. Yeah, it's an upside down look at the world, but it's also a much simpler way of living, a a way that says Jesus is first, Jesus is primary, Jesus is everything about me, because he's changed and made everything new about me. You may have thought that life was about sports, uh, about academics, uh, about achievements, about music, about art, about where you can go, what you can achieve, what you can accomplish, and what you can acquire. But Jesus shows us that 
life at its simplest. Life as God has designed it ought to be lived for him because Jesus is all that matters. Hope that's encouraging to you. We did not get far at all in the book of James, but I hope that's encouraging and challenging to you. Let me pray for you. God, thanks for uh, for these high school students uh, who have the opportunity at their age to make such a difference. God, I pray that the difference that we make together here at CVCS, here in our community, is one that makes a difference for you. Uh, Lord, help us to have the courage to set aside what doesn't matter so that we can pursue what absolutely always matters, a relationship with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for bringing us that message. That was beautiful. I'm now joined in the podcast studio with uh, Pastor Brandon Reed for a short interview. So my first question is just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, born and raised in Tennessee, have a wife and two kids, and uh, been a pastor now for 19 years. Wow. Wow. Thank you. That's amazing. Have you always been a pastor at Mountain View? No. So I've been a pastor in Virginia, Tennessee, uh, Florida and California. Wow, so, that's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Uh, well, I'm glad that you made it to California and you're able to share with um, our community here. What do you hope students take away from your message today? Yeah, my hope is that uh, students would understand that Jesus never gives up on us. Mm-hmm. Whatever's going on, uh, whatever's happening around us, the circumstances that we're in, uh, w- whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, it doesn't mean Jesus isn't with us if things aren't going well. Yeah, yeah. Um, he never gives up on us. Yes. Uh, wherever we Amen. are at and however far that we run, uh, God is a God who's with us, mm-hmm. showing us that in the incarnation of Christ. Yes, thank you. That was such an encouragement to hear as a student. And I think it's simple and it's and it should be easy to remember, but but we so often forget that. Yeah. And we're constantly in need of those reminders of just the faithfulness that God has for us. So thank you. And then if anybody would like to get more connected with you, how could they do so? Yeah, you can connect with our church, Mountain View Church at mvc.life. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Brandon Reed. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. This episode has been a production of the Capistrano Valley Christian Schools Podcast Network. Capistrano Valley Christian Schools is a Christian JK-12 school in San Juan Capistrano, California. Be sure to check out, subscribe to, and leave a review of this show and the other shows on our network on your podcast player of choice. Doing so supports the school community in a multitude of ways. For more information about the CVCS Podcast Network or any of our other shows, check out cvcs.org or email podcasts at cvcs.org. On behalf of the whole network, this is Mr. Jasper saying thank you again for listening and stay tuned for more.